AC, it's September, um, and we are going beyond Hammerland. You know, we, we experienced a haunting uh, a little while back, and, yes, we and we're going back to another haunted house. In, in fact, Hell House. We're going to explore the legend of Hell House from 1973, celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. And unlike our conversation about the classic uh, Robert Wise horror film, uh, this one is going to be a lot more agreeable <laughs> uh, I think because I flat out love The Legend of Hell House. Shouldn't have been a surprise because it's adapted from a, a Richard Matheson novel, one that I have not read, but mm. I'd kind of forgotten about that. So when I saw it in the opening credits, I'm like, bingo, it's going to be a good time and I'm going to have some homework to do after it's over. So got to got to find that book. But well, um, Hell House is a great read. Uh, uh, the, the story goes that Matheson was kind of annoyed that the Shirley Jackson novel, Haunting of Hill House, uh, he didn't like the fact that there was some, you know, there was some question as to whether it was actually a haunted house or it was all happening in the mind of the, of the, the, the Nell, the, the heroine. And he's like, I'm going to write a story where there's no question. This is a friggin' haunted house. And it, what I love about it is kind of like uh, Legend of, I'm sorry, kind of like The Haunting, you know, it's clearly inspired by that. We have two male, two female. We have them going to investigate a supposedly haunted house. Um, you know, the premises are very uh, similar. And also the the wife of the investigating doctor shows up and, and yep. kind of ends up getting involved in all the drama. Yeah, it, it, it was kind of strange to me watching this movie because I thought, is this a remake of The Haunting? Not mm. quite. And I'd forgotten that they're completely two different books and, uh, and, you know, basically inspirations. So this one is again from 1973 directed by John Huff. Um, I, I, if, I thought about calling him John Howe, um, <laughs> but I keep thinking about Michael Goff, who also shows yeah. up in a surprise cameo in this movie. Yes, he does. And I learned how to pronounce his name by listening to Joel Schumacher on an audio commentary for the Batman movie he directed forever ago. There you go. I kept, kept saying Michael Goff. I'm like, like cough weird. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and I had forgotten that, or I didn't realize that was him at the end until I was looking at the credits. I'm like, oh, that's why he looked familiar. Um, makes a lovely looking corpse. But, well, also, um, I met uh, I met John Huff's son, Paul Huff, who's also a filmmaker. Uh, he he did a terrific movie in 2012 or 2013 called The Human Race, which is well worth checking out. But I ran into Paul at the Fantasia Film Festival, and then later at uh, in Brussels at the Brussels Film Festival when he was. Uh, when he was touring with his his movie, and I actually got to meet his father, John Huff, at the Brussels 2013 festival. And what a lovely man! Uh, John Huff, uh, he's he's one of those few who has both directed for Disney and for Hammer. Because what directed, did he make for Disney? Well, for for Hammer, he did Twins of Evil, and for Disney, he did The Escape from Witch Mountain and Return to Witch Mountain as well as The Watcher in the Woods. Uh, and so I, I just, I was like, wait a minute, you were like my childhood right here because not only did you terrify me with Legend of Hell House, you know, like I love the Witch Mountain movies when I was a kid. You know, and I don't think I've seen those. Um, so mm. yeah, more more homework I got to do. But uh, <laughs> this, well, since we're swapping stories, I met uh, Roddy McDowell, who stars in this movie. Uh, uh, on the street once he was doing a play in Chicago and he just happened to walk by me. So I, I was that guy. I went up That's to him because awesome. he was waiting at a stoplight and I went and I said, Mr. McDowell, I'm a huge fan, loved you in Fright Night. And he was so lovely for the, for the two minutes that we interacted before he had to cross the street. But um, yeah, I was a huge fan of his work in Fright Night because that's pretty much all I'd seen at that point. I was in art school. So uh, mm. now that I've experienced more of his full range of amazing abilities in the legend of Hell House, um, I can say that I'm glad that I didn't know much more about him because I would have just been a, a fawning, <laughs> drooling idiot. He's so good. <laughs> yeah, he's wonderful. I, I love I love the whole cast here and similar to The Haunting. I love the whole cast there. I love the I think the cast for Hell House is so strong. And I knew Roddy McDowell from the Planet of the Apes movies. You know, it's like because I, I grew up, you know, watching the Battle for the Planet of the Apes and Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Once it just ran all the time on Saturday. So that voice, hearing that voice come out of a human face was like, oh my gosh, that's that's so weird. Uh, and then you realize, no, the other thing would be weird. 
Uh, but I love I love Roddy McDowell and and everything I've heard is just what a lovely human being he was. A great photographer. There there are several books of his photography on sets and behind the scenes and things like that. But he just sounds like somebody who just loved the craft, loved filmmaking, loved acting, and uh, and he's just wonderful in this. He plays Fisher, who's a a mental medium or physical medium rather. He's a physical medium who is the lone survivor of the two previous excursions to Hell House because the setup is uh, he's been, you know, um, our, I forget our, our professor's name. Uh, Professor Barrett or Dr. That's Barrett. Right. Yeah. Dr. Barrett has been asked by a billionaire or millionaire to go and check out Hell House and come back with proof. Is there life after death or not? And that's, you know, the, the whole setup of the film, the, the opening scene, it, it very much reminded me of like a Tales from the Crypt comic. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, this rich dying old man, he wants to know if there's an afterlife. We don't get into that, but you <laughs> kind of wonder, I got to know if I'm in any kind of trouble because the way I've been living, plus I'm really old, so I may be on death's right. door. And they never really go back to that. It's just this whole idea that um, Barrett and his uh, team are going to be basically put in hell house for four days i think they go in on december 20th and they come yeah. out on, on christmas, christmas eve <laughs> <laughs> on christmas eve right right it's the, um, evening, the evening of christmas uh, christmas of christmas eve eve yeah right so they they're supposed to be in there to find out you know the mystery of hell house and and because it is notoriously haunted yep. uh, in addition to fisher's experience which was 20 years earlier because it was 1953 yep. he was one of uh there were eight other people with him in the house at that point and all of them it's strange because i feel like there might have been a contradiction maybe you can help me out here because i thought that he was the only one who had survived but he talks about how some of the people he was in the house with ended up like crippled or going insane. Right. I think that's it, that, that, that he was the only one who emerged relatively intact. Uh, okay. Like, you know, people, the people, some people died and some people just, you know, were not the same afterwards. They were, as you said, kind of, uh, destroyed like by the house. Yeah. Like spinal injury. They like had their legs crushed or whatever. Um, but, and then they, you hear further back, this is almost like the Overlook Territory, uh, back in 1929, the, they broke, someone broke into the house to discover that there were 27 uh, corpses in there because uh, Mr. Belasco, who owned the house, is the Belasco house, right. um, he apparently was into witchcraft, devil worship, bestiality, depraved sex like that's a laundry list of pretty much everything you could be into that is not going to church except you know black mass apparently yeah. um <laughs> and yeah everyone just wound up dead and i guess the idea is that their spirits are trapped in this house it torments people especially those who are psychically attuned we know the story what we don't know is how the story is going to manifest in this case because you've got the physical medium um uh, Mr. Fisher. And then you've got Florence Tanner played by uh, Pamela Franklin, yep. who is a psychic medium. Uh, and then you've got Dr. Barrett and his wife, Anne, uh, played by, by Gail Honeycutt. They go, they stay in this house, they explore it, they notice some weird things going on, some strange phenomena. It's not, there, there are some surprises towards, I think, the very end. But what I noticed was even the, the jump scares, the haunted house check list of like okay now the dishes are going to fly against the wall and the tables are going to shake and there's like weird stuff happening in beds it all felt new to me i've seen a hundred mm. of these types of movies but it's something about the way huff directed it and i don't know if it's portrayed this way in the book uh, or not but he loves his dutch angles he loves mm -hmm. the fact that even when they cut to exteriors of the house where they have title cards saying december 21st 10 30 p.m it's still like light out yeah i didn't catch read that as a mistake i felt almost like hell house once these people were inside it sort of in its own perpetually foggy eerie dimension yep. aside from our reality there's just so much going on visually here and you're right with the amazing performances from everybody in the cast uh this is i think just about a perfect horror movie well and i think you you kind of nailed it like because i think John Huff realizes, hey, you know, I'm doing a, another haunted house movie, you know, like it's just how can I make this special? I feel like he and Alan Hume, who's our director of photography, uh, 
like they tr contrived to how can we shoot this differently? How can we make this look and feel differently? And 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 that's that was one of the things I love about it is that they're working overtime to make it feel different. They're like this isn't the same old story, and I feel like that's kind of what Matheson was doing in his novel. He's like, this isn't the same old creaky haunted house. You this one like this house has sexual designs on people. And it's it's really kind of dealing in the perversity of it. Like it 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 it's it is a vehicle through which Emmerich Belasco functions, and all of the depravity that he exhibited in his life is carried on in the afterlife. And I I just again I've never I've never heard of a story like that. I've never heard of a house like that. And I love the fact that that it is all of these souls that are purportedly trapped in the house that are doing the haunting. And as we, as we go along, we learn maybe that's the case and maybe that isn't. Well, I, I was going to say, because um, there's a theory towards the end and I can't exactly ima remember how they arrived at this, but it was the idea that it wasn't 27 or however many souls are trapped in here because that we, we talk, we hear about 1929, we hear about 1953, but we don't know exactly how many other people have passed through this house uh, and been affected by it or killed. So it could be, you know, hundreds for all we yeah. know, yeah. but uh, Fisher who like, let me put on the spoiler banner just in okay, case great. people let's, are watching this. Cause let I, us I, dive in. <laughs> yes. <laughs> High level thoughts. Seek this movie out own it it's it's a wonderful film um but the fisher decides or discovers realizes whatever that it's not a whole bunch of spirits it's kind of made to feel that way but it's just belasco and his dark depraved soul that is you know controlling everything that's going on in the house um i also like that apparently according to fisher again i'm not sure if this is conjecture if this is something that he has intuited or experienced in his previous stay in hell house but he says, essentially, the house doesn't mind people passing through like a mm. couple people coming in and staying there. It might be spooky, but the house isn't going to mess with them. It's when people try and attack the house right. to try and examine it or exercise it. That's when the, the evil comes out. And I th that's a fascinating idea. In addition to like the idea of having a sexually perverse personality that is trying to inflict on its victims, the idea that it is selective. It's, you know, just don't poke the bear and you'll probably be fine. <laughs> Right, right. And I mean, that's the thing is that this house feels dangerous and, and in a purely malevolent way. This isn't like a curse that needs to be lifted. It's not looking for, you know, not, not, not looking for eternal rest. And I love the fact that Belasco is like, I'm going to pretend to be this character. I'm going to pretend to be this character. And that's how I can attack the various people. Yeah, and I also love that, okay, the revelation, I'm going to jump ahead a bit here, but, you know, we are in spoiler territory. When they discover that Belasco's preserved body is actually in the house, hmm. and he, this is, this is a testament to this guy, what he was like when he was alive. His legend, his reputation was that he was six foot five, a towering, belligerent, malevolent presence in life. It's discovered that he, you know, when they find his body, it's sitting in a chair, perfectly preserved, I think holding a wine glass or something. And uh, Fisher drives a stake or a spear or something into his leg. And, you know, Anne, who is with him, kind of re recoils in horror. But it just strikes plastic because he's got, you know, artificial limbs. It's not that he was born without legs or there was some kind of an accident. Apparently, if I have this right, he was born like embarrassingly short and he, would rather have the control of having severed his own legs and having artificial yep. legs than to deal with being just genetically short. It's like, I never would have thought about that, but that's a Lego, a le level of egotism or a Lego of egotism <laughs> that I'd never even considered before. Well, and that's just, again, I feel like that is a, it's a bit of a divisive ending because people are like, wait, what? Like, that's <laughs> why he is the way he is is because he was short and and he's so insane that he cuts off his own legs and then you, you kind of wonder like well how how depraved sexually could he have been but you know like uh, it, it's it is a fascinating it's a fascinating look into insanity like 
that this is the way it's going to exhibit itself with him is that he's going to cut his own legs off. Uh, right. Along, along with, I'm sorry, I don't want to, I just don't, don't want to lose track of this, but when we were talking okay. about the, the feel of the film, a, along with the cinematography, I feel like the music, like there's an electronic score that kind of uh, just underlines everything. And I just want to throw out uh, Delia Derbyshire and Brian Hodgson, and they had also worked on the sound and music departments for Doctor Who episodes, which oh. I think you go, oh, yes. Like Once you hear it, you're like, absolutely, I can hear that kind of Doctor Who tone. Yeah, totally. Um, I also, you know, going back to the insecurity of this um, Belasco character, when, the, there, of course, there's a secret um, uh, church, like a dark church that's buried in the house, and they find it like a chapel. Um, horrible things happen in there. And the big kind of final confrontation uh, goes down and there's like stuff flying around and, you know, wind and Fisher is screaming or, you know, Roddy McDowell oh, is screaming and he's hurling insults at Belasco saying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Mr. F Mr. Six foot five, more like Mr. <laughs> five foot two, five foot one, <laughs> we're even five foot tall. And then, <laughs> and then you hear, no, <laughs> like that last insult yep. was what drove him away. And then they find the, the, the body and, Allegedly, the house is clean, possibly only clean of Belasco. This is where the ending gets a bit ambiguous for me anyway, mm -hmm. because there's a closing shot of Belasco's you know, corpse, his dead face. But then we hear what sounds like a woman that could have been Florence, maybe mm -hmm. her ghost now trapped in the house with mm -hmm. um, Dr. Barrett, who did not make it out of this encounter. Yeah, well, that's just it. Like the fact that like two people go down and not in a pretty way. Oh boy, is it not pretty. Um, and it's, I feel like I've seen this in other horror movies. I don't know if it was unique to Hell House, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to bring up Friday the 13th, Aaron. So, so brace yourself. Uh, the first movie, there was the guy, I don't remember his name, but he was the one in the plaid shirt who goes out to like find the other campers or something. Mm. And then he shows up. Uh, Alice opens the door to the the one cabin and he's like nailed to it like horrifically he's got like spikes through his groin and his eyes they kind of do that with Dr. Barrett where he is yeah. attacked but it's just kind of a mild like an instrument I think blows up in his face but the next time we see him is when Anne discovers his body and it's in the chapel it's got candles sort of driven into all of his body parts his face is horribly mutilated I mean it's it's rough stuff but you get the feeling that the the depravity of the man who is the spirit mixed with whatever almost a century or, or how many decades of bad mojo going on in this house just really taking up that violence in that third act in the way that we haven't really seen it it's kind of teased earlier on but it comes full force in the end well and that that scene or that shot of dr barrett used to be the cover art for the vhs release and it was just like but it was like his face is so distorted that you couldn't tell who it was, but it was, it, I remember that box art scaring the crap out of me. And I'm like, Oh man, I don't know if I'm ready for this. Um, and this was, this was one that, you know, I'd heard about for years. And when I finally caught up with it, it lived up to its reputation. I was like, this is really a great haunted house movie. It is one of my favorites. You know, when I think about haunted house movies, this one usually is one, among the, among the select few that I'll, I'll throw out. It's a, it's a great blanket movie. And I think maybe we've talked about that where you're watching it and it's so like <laughs> chillingly atmosphere. You feel like you should like have a blanket wrapped around you. This is the perfect, yeah. you know, October evening, got a, a mug of hot cider and you want to watch a good, you know, scary movie. This is, this is it, man. And I feel like everything was so well thought out. Did you read, I assume you've read the Matheson novel. I have. It's been a while, but I, I remember I, I saw the movie first and then I came around to Hell House, the, the book. Is it is it very different or is it pretty much spot on? It's 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 very similar in terms of the content. What is amped up is the sexuality, uh, mm. the sexual violence that is visited on both Florence and on Anne um, and just the kind of the overtness of it. Uh, and I think says something along the lines of, you know, touch me or I'll find somebody else who will. Yes. And she says things of that nature, but of a more explicit 
uh, of a more explicit tone. This is also the same year that The Exorcist came out. You know, 1973, both films celebrating their 50th anniversaries. It's amazing. Um, and that was the first time I, I watched that movie when I was way too young. Um, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm reading the William Peter Blatty novel right now uh, in preparation for watching it, watching the film next month. But it just seems like both Friedkin and Hoff, whether or not they were conscious of each other's work, I doubt it. But they were both pushing the envelope in terms of the genre and what you can do to freak people out. It's no longer, ooh, something's going bump in the night. There's chilling stuff as far as sexuality, as far as possession. I mean, you think of Reagan and the horrible things that she said and did before her head even started spinning around. In this movie, you've got Florence. She gets possessed and it's very much a tortured kind of she's like tortured and un you know unwilling to you know submit and then there are scenes where she kind of turns into this like predatory like sex kitten and she's trying to you know lure other people into further into the house's web both yeah there's something going on with these these films and i feel like this is going to be a big statement cuz i'm way more ignorant of these kinds of movies than i should be but it feels like these changed the way that people thought about these kinds of movies going forward am i wrong i i don't know if that's in, I, I don't know if that's true or not true but it definitely i mean i don't know the last time or the first time we had a spectral rape on in a movie you know like i immediately think of the entity which is 1981 82 80 it's somewhere in there like it's in the early 80s but you know like Florence is seduced and then taken, you know, by force. And it's, it's, that's terrifying and, and awful because we really like her. We really relate to her because she is the one who's trying to resolve this in a peaceful way. She's trying to connect and allow these spirits to move on as opposed to uh, our, our doctor who's like, I'm just going to shut this whole thing down. I'm going to, you know, it's, everything's just an electrical force and I'm going to suck all the, the power out of it. Like a big spiritual uh, ectoplasmic uh, vacuum cleaner. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, well, I love that. He like, he, he talks about draining the house like a battery, you know, and he brings in his fancy equipment and, and, uh, and I love when Tan, uh, Florence like attacks the machine it is Florence, right? Who attacks it? Yeah. Or is mm -hmm. it, is it okay? It's like when Florence attacks the, the machine and you go, it's, you know, you wonder, is that just Belasco playing or is he actually scared of the machine? Oh, I hadn't even thought about that. I Because the machine does its thing and we get the sense that, you know, things are, things have been cleaned, but Belasco knows that he's got another trick up his sleeve. And now that I'm thinking that way, uh, you know, you're leading me down this path. Maybe he was playing with everybody and he compelled Florence to attack the machine, even though he knew that even if this thing got turned on, it wouldn't do any good. He just wanted right. to cause some more strife because she attacks the machine, then uh, Barrett punches her out, like knocks right, her right. unconscious. Uh, and then things get you know really crazy as, as we go into deep into the third act. Um, but you know, before you move on from, from Florence, I want to say that you know Pamela Franklin, she is great in this movie and you kind of feel like she's going to be the you know the final girl yeah you know um but she, she's top build i think it's that either maybe her or Audie mcdowell i'm not sure who which one but she's right up there yeah i think gail honeycutt who is the final girl i think she's like she might be an and <laughs> in, the, in the opening credits um but what was really interesting to me and striking is we see a lot of these movies particularly i know we're not officially in hammerland but you know kind of an offshoot but the scantily clad young you know ingenue who's very attractive usually in some form of state of undress i feel like huff was really playing with the expectation of that image in this movie because there's so much sexual violence visited on her and she shows that she wears the scars of it um yeah. she's burned she's slashed but she keeps showing up in these kind of revealing like you know 90s or whatever and so the temptation for you know lecherous old men like me is to like admire the full form but then you realize 
oh, that's not hot because she's got these scratches right. and burn marks over it. And that reminds me of the horrible things she's been through. So it's almost like uh, a dare on the part of the filmmaker. Like I'm you, you try objectify this. <laughs> you know? Right. No, I agree. I agree. And, and that's the thing. It's like she is she's being viewed in that way. But also, you know, she is she is a victim over and over again. Yeah. You know, and, and I love the fact that you, it's Pamela Franklin who was in the innocence, you know, like one of the first great ghost stories. And, you know, here she is again, you know, <laughs> facing off of the supernatural. And at her, you know, death scene with the giant weird crucifix falling on her. I mean, that, spoiler, that's the image I'm using for the for the thumbnail of her, like kind of crawling out from underneath it. And, mm. you know, it's so striking. I, I also got to say there's a scene with um, a cat that <laughs> I was watching this scene and I knew we were going to talk about it because a black cat first. I think we first see this cat in one of the, you know, establishing shots of Hell House where they yeah. show like a, the time progression. It yeah. crosses right in front of the screen like we don't just see it walking. It crosses our path as the viewer and given, mm -hmm. you know, showing us we're about to descend further into the bad luck of this movie. Um, but at one point, Florence is in a room, the cat uh, comes in and it starts screaming and attacking her and she's fighting it off. And we've seen some recent examples of, of horrible animal, animal puppetry slash people writhing around, you know, with animal dolls, the editing, in this movie is so tight that I was like, I can't make fun of this. This is really convincing. I think oh, it's good. because by the, it cuts so quickly that by the time it registers like, Oh yeah, she's just like swinging her body around with a, with a doll. You're already on to the next shot. Yeah. That scene, that scene does take a little bit of grief online, but I'm glad it didn't uh, take you out of the movie. No. And I like the coda of it too, where she finally gets into another room and locks the door and she's backed up against this, this mirror <laughs> and she's like looking, you know, just looks completely shell shocked. And you can see the little paws coming from underneath the door. That was a little bit cheesy, but again, uh, Pamela, anybody Franklin's who's lived with cats. Yeah. Anybody who's lived uh, with cats knows that's a real thing. <laughs> cat, the cat will be like reaching underneath the door to try and get you. I don't know if I ever talked to you about the first uh, apartment I lived in in the city, which was haunted. And uh, one of the ways we found out about that was uh, via our cats um, doing something very similar. Mm -hmm. um, that's for another that's for another time. Um, yeah, I, let's talk about this machine, this uh, or kind of related to that. There's this air of science, scientism in this movie they're talking about ectoplasm they're talking about there's like this ectoplasmic goo that's coming off of florence during one of the seances right, we see it being, i mean it's very explicit yeah but i like that you know barrett is he's not freaked out by it really he's just like oh this is interesting he's collecting information and that's why he thinks he can beat this thing by sucking up all the residue as you put it uh like a battery um it just I'm glad that there wasn't a scientific explanation to this because I felt like I was being led down that path. Like when they discover uh, Belasco in that room, at first it doesn't even look like he's dead. It just looks like he's sitting there waiting. I'm like, oh, did he just engineer this whole thing to like scare people away so they wouldn't touch his millions or something? Or what, what happened? It's like the Wizard of Oz. Yes. Yeah. That um, I definitely had that image in my head of like, they have peeked behind the curtain and it has robbed him of his power, you know, I, but I love, I mean, that, that scene you were referring to earlier where, where McDowell is facing off against the house and you're watching this wind and you're watching him just being like blown across the room sometimes. And it, it I, I get nostalgic for practical effects like that, as opposed to the CGI, you know, Marvel punch, where somebody ends up flying, you know, like 40 feet away and landing in front of the camera. And you're like, okay, that nobody did that. No, no stunt person actually did that. Like I, I know Roddy McDowell didn't get blown across the room, but I know somebody got blown across the room and that helps make it cool. It does. And you know, did you watch the Pope's exorcist that Russell I haven't Crowe yet. Movie? I saw that you, you talked about it recently. I haven't seen it yet. It's one of those things where it's an okay movie driven largely by his performance because he's kind of like a cheeky exorcist. You know, he's very funny in the role, 
But my problem with that movie largely was that it's half cheeky comedy and half horror movie, but the horror mm. elements don't work at all because it's just like every other damned possessed movie for the last 20, 30 years. And I'm watching Hell House. I'm like, this movie came out 50 years ago yeah. and I'm still shocked by some of the stuff I'm seeing. Yeah. You know, it's again, it's the the filmmaking and the editing can, you know, in one instance, plates being thrown across a room and shattering against a wall is like, OK, I get it. And in other cases, it's like, oh, my God, I <laughs> what else is it's it's just it's the chaotic nature of it. Kind of like going back to The Exorcist or even Poltergeist when Joe Beth Williams opens up the door to the bedroom and like everything is flying around and it's all weird and unexpected. This movie has that in spades. And I think. If you haven't seen The Legend of Hell House and you're getting cynical and burned out on modern horror, kind of like I am, this is a movie that will probably blow you away. That move that that moment you're talking about right there with the plates being thrown, what I think also makes that work so well is that it it's not just the house attacking. Uh Dr. Barrett turns to Florence and like you did that, and it turns them against each other. Like they are not a unified front, you know, like the, 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 the house is splitting them apart constantly. Right. And there's um, there's the bit where Fisher is talking about, you know, I'm going to take my hundred thousand dollars and I'm going to move. I'm not coming within a thousand miles of this place. Right. Well, and, and, and we haven't talked about that. The fact that like Fisher is the one who survived and he is coming back kind of reluctantly but he is not open. He is guarded. He's like, he's not, he's not participating in the experiment. And you don't, you don't judge him poorly for it. You're like, that seems like the smart thing to do, considering how dangerous this house continues to prove itself to be. Well, it's also, you know, this movie very well could have been a sequel to something else. Because it very much, they keep making reference to 1953 and, and other previous events. And when you realize this is a standalone film, it's almost masterful because you end up playing, imagining who those other eight people would have right. been. And what my biggest mystery, one of the big mysteries to me about Hell House is it's established that Fisher, basically he survived, but he wasn't the same. Like he right. had a nervous breakdown and he's kind of like, you know, edgy. And for the first time, 10 15 minutes he's on the screen i don't think he says anything and i wondered really, if this yeah. is gonna be like the silent bob kind of treatment where maybe he speaks at the very end but no it just takes him a while to open up um but i just i wondered about that history but he seemed a little bit too put together i didn't get like you know crazy person out of him i right. just got someone who was very guarded as you said yep it's like he's coming in there and he's like i'm going to get through this and I'm going to take the money and I'm going to go away. And I, there's a great scene where he does kind of like open up and try to, and you see that house just like attack him and, and he shuts everything back down again. He's like, Nope, I was right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's also like when he taps into that heroism, when he's like, I, I have to, sh I have to face this house mm -hmm. now. Because if it's not me, other people are going to come and other people are going to die. And maybe your husband didn't need to die. And maybe Florence didn't need to die if I had, you know, uh, confronted it sooner. And so it really does feel like this great showdown, you know, this great duel. But I also like that, you know, he's essentially telling Anne, you know, like, I got to go do this thing. You keep yourself safe. But she's like, why like, like you you don't know you we can just run you don't have to do that and that's when he gives a whole heroic speech but that scene that you referenced a second ago where he opens himself up to the house mm. again you know in a modern context he would have been like floating off the floor he would have opened his eyes and they'd be like you know red or black and he would start speaking in modulated tones Yep. This is all just his performance. He goes into kind of a uh, almost like an epileptic seizure. Uh, he he throws himself, I think, out of this chair onto the floor and starts like writhing on the ground and, and almost like freezing in place. There's so much that you can do with a great performance that you can't buy for a million dollars of fancy computer animation. I agree. Well, let, since we're talking about performances, the scene between Fisher and Anne 
when she's possessed and she comes down the stairs and she says the whole touch me or I'll find somebody who will like that scene between the two of them, because Roddy McDowell is looking at her and he recognizes that she's not herself. And when he slaps her, it is done like with so much, uh, uh, there's so much goodwill attached to it. Like it's done as a, as a favor. It's done as a tool to snap her out of it. And it doesn't feel like he's triggered or anything. He just goes, I have to try to get her out of this because like, otherwise she's going to do something that she's going to regret. And that, and the watching her, and when she snaps out of her reverie and she, you know, senses where, what she's done and where she is, like the expression on her face is just, it's terror. It just like, it's, it's heartbreaking. Oh yeah. Gail Honeycutt is, is great in this movie. I think partially because of having watched the haunting and seeing what the, the wife of the doctor character who comes in at the very end and she's a very particular type. I kind of expected that here. And when she's introduced, you do get a little bit of that sense, but she, again, like all the other characters in this movie opens up and, and we see many dimensions to her. Yeah. You know, what I loved about that scene that you're mentioning is she comes down the stairs when she's finally talking to uh, Fisher up close. She's completely naked, like her her gown has fallen to the floor, but we never see her her right. nude body. Uh, you know, he Fisher sees it, obviously, but he I think he picks up the robe and, you know, hands it to her and says, you know, go to bed, uh, you know, Mrs. Barrett or, or whatever. But yeah, it is that moment of like almost like Eve realizing her nakedness with with Adam. They're both like they're embarrassed. They're afraid of getting caught or that they have been caught and they both don't know what to do. And you get the feeling that we're never going to talk about this <laughs> Yeah, right. again. But that that sequel idea that I was talking about, I almost feel like in 1953, if perhaps Fisher had been in a similar situation where a spirit had tried to seduce him in that house, maybe he made a different choice. Mm -hmm. Maybe he did get caught up in a moment and then he realized, oh, this isn't real. So now 20 years later, when he sees it happening again, he's like, I'm going to I know what this is now. I'm not going to fall for it. I'm going to help this person who I could probably have my way with and you know, be damned all to hell. But I yeah. understand what I'm dealing with now. Yeah, I, I really I, I like that idea of uh, it being almost like a sequel, um, because, of course, you know, because it's referencing the haunting you know, both the, the novel and the film at this point, you know, like it's easy to kind of think about what went before with the haunting. And then this is like the darker version. What's interesting though, is that this is a PG rated film. What? Yeah. This, this, I, this I didn't film, even notice that. <laughs> yeah. This film's PG rated and you go, you know, like, but because it doesn't show anything and it doesn't say anything explicit, like you, you would have to, you would have to be, you know, leaning up to your parent and going, well, what, what just happened? What does that mean? Um, and I wonder, uh, this being the year of the exorcist, I wonder if it had gone further, if it would have landed as well, you know, like, because part of the reason the exorcist was so successful is that it did dare to go places that no other film had gone before. And it would have been interesting had Legend of Hell House beaten them to the punch and, you know, been more explicit. I don't think I would like that film as much. I really like the restraint shown here. I like the fact that so much is suggested and so little is actually shown. Uh, but it is, it's an interesting thought to think, you know, like, like that maybe this film didn't go far enough for people and that's why it hasn't endured in terms of popular culture in the way that the exorcist has. Uh, I can't speak to that. It's it's I'm still hung up on this idea because Pamela Franklin, we see her pretty much full nude. I mean, it's in kind of silhouette, but if you're right. watching this on <laughs> in high definition, there's, there's nothing left to the imagination. <laughs> um, and on top of that, it le it's again, you see her, she's a very attractive lady. She's got a nice figure and all that. She gets into bed and then almost immediately you see the ghost starting to rip away the covers. Right. They don't show anything there, but it's like, yeah, there's the, you're supposed to be enticed by this, but we're not going to let you be enticed because something terrible is happening to a person in this scene. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, 
Huh. I, d- how many times have you seen this movie? Oh gosh. I mean, it's, it's probably, you know, six, seven, eight. It, this is one that I saw. I saw uh, later in life, like in my thirties and have returned to it again and again, and again, whenever I'm thinking about a nice haunted house movie that uh, that's going to give me the willies. Is there anything wrong with this movie? Because aside from issues, not even issues, but surprises in the third act, mostly with the reveal of Belasco behind that wall, right. which kind of took me out of them. Like, oh, that's a different idea, which second viewing, I probably, since I know it's coming, I won't even think about it. But is there, what what would you change about this movie? Are there any flaws here? Because I can't think of any. I think the um, Clive Revel as the, as Dr. Barrett, he's a bit strident, I think, for some people. Um, I know my wife was kind of like, that guy's just a dick. And I don't, and, and it would be, it would been great to have a more human side as, I mean, kind of, I think about Richard Johnson as the, the professor in The Haunting, where he's genuinely likable and he's very practical. You know, like he, he is clearly, you know, like taking this seriously, but he's not, uh, he's not pushing people around. Like all the characters in The Haunting are likable. And I feel like, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Barrett is not necessarily likable. I don't think he's intended to be either. He's he's definitely a, an odd character. And let me ask you about this because he's contracted by that guy in the beginning to find out the truth about the afterlife, what he right. can glean about that from Hell House. It seems like the plot almost changes, where it's like he's supposed to clean up Hell House by the time you know <laughs> he's let out the next day. What what is because he definitely finds proof right. that there are ghosts, there are malevolent forces awaiting on the other side. So. Couldn't he just take a vial of I ectoplasm think, back to the billionaire and say, here's your proof? I think that's right. I think it becomes a personal thing for him where he's like, I want to prove my dominance over this house. I want to show what I'm capable of. You know, that hubris. Um, you know, I think that, and I think, again, that makes him less a less likable character. And not that that's necessarily a flaw, but I think it does, it, it can prove off-putting for some viewers. I think the cat moment is one that also... Some people have uh, again have taken a task. Uh, I I I love this film. I feel like it's just it's terrific, and I like the fact that it is a faithful adaptation of Matheson's novel. Even if it has to, even if it cleans things up a little bit for uh, for polite society. Sure, um, I I love it too, and you know I. I... I'm going to say it. I love this movie more than The Haunting. Yep, I got that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but no, I will say that they do have some things in common, which is a great house. You know, yeah, even yeah. though this is in color, it reminded me of Hammer Films, you know, the, mm. the wonderful production design, the lavish colors. The, the I think it's in uh, Florence's room is purple with this purple textured wallpaper. And it's just so spooky. Even the establishing of the billionaire millionaire's home in the beginning that almost looked like it could have been the setting for this movie. Like they start out there like, Oh, this isn't where we're going. That, Cause this is, <laughs> it's broad daylight and I'm already freaked out. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I can't think of anything. Yes. The cat thing. Sure. But you got to think it's 1973. Sure. What else are you going to do? Now you being a big star Wars fan, do you, did you recognize Clive Revel's uh, connection to star Wars? Uh, not specifically, but I get, I kept getting that. I know that face feeling it's, it's less the face. It's the voice. He's the voice of the emperor in the original empire strikes back before he was replaced by Ian McDiarmid in subsequent versions, but he's the original voice of the emperor. Wow. But I, what else what other movies has he appeared in because i definitely i had that weird feeling like i know i know this you guy. know i and i went back and i looked at uh, he's done a lot of stuff but nothing that just like jumps out at me i get the sense that he's kind of that guy you know mm. you see him in as, as a supporting role and i can absolutely picture him as that cop or that army lieutenant or you know because <laughs> he's got that kind of face and that kind of stiff upper lip british quality to him i felt the same way about gail honeycutt i'm like 
where do I know her from? But it looks like her biggest credit was opposite James Garner in the movie Marlowe. And again, not a huge, not a huge, uh, movie big enough that, that people would be like, oh, it's Gail Honeycutt from Marlowe. So I don't know why I know Gail Honeycutt, but I, I think she's terrific in this. Yeah, there's there's not a dud in the bunch. In fact, they're, you know, they're all stellar in their own ways. But um, I think this has been a stellar conversation, and I am happy to close the door to Hell House, having figured out the secret of the quote-unquote legend. <laughs> um, but uh, AC, coming up next month, you've got a big, big month ahead of you. It's Tell true. us, what, what do you have going on for October? <laughs> well, October, we'll be doing our annual uh, Scarathon fundraiser, and we'll be reviewing 31 movies in 31 days over at the Horror 101 with Dr. AC YouTube channel. So, and, you know, we'll be jumping back onto the Kicking the Seat channel and doing a big old live extravaganza uh, toward the end of the month. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it. And I, I love that we've been co-pilots for the uh, the Friday Night Fright uh, fundraising for several years now. So looking forward to to this year as well. Yes, definitely. Uh, it's going to be a huge month, and I'm excited because a lot of these movies, are, as as is your tradition, going to be first time views for you, and you're going to have some some panel shows, and uh, hopefully I'll be get get to be part of those. And yeah, a lot of a lot of great stuff coming up, and of course we'll be talking about. Something beyond Hammerland. Again, I don't have the schedule up in front of me, but I'm just going to let that be a surprise um, for both of us. So, uh, yeah, AC, you mentioned uh, your site, uh, Horror 101 with Dr. AC, uh, on YouTube and on the Internet. You know, go look up his written reviews. You're going to be posting the the, the micro-reviews of the, the, the movies you watch during the Scarathon. So that's always fun. And, um, yeah, if you like this show, everybody, please... Like and subscribe, uh, support AC. All of his information is down below. And uh, until next time, whenever that is, whatever that is, thanks very much for watching Beyond Hammerland and take care.